Well, hey friends, this is your buddy Carl with the daily Bible reading. So we're going to dive right in. It is February 19th. How about that? February 19th. Let's pick it up right here in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 28. And we go through all the way through 9, chapter 9, verse 6. So Leviticus chapter 7, 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present a peace offering to the Lord, bring part of it as a gift to the Lord. Present it to the Lord with your own hands as a special gift to the Lord. Bring the fat of the animal together with the breast and lift up the breast as a special offering to the Lord. Then the priest will burn the fat on the altar, but the breast will belong to Aaron and his descendants. Give the right thigh of your peace offering to the priest as a gift. The right thigh must always be given to the priest who offers the blood and the fat of the peace offering. For I have reserved the breast of the special offering and the right thigh of the sacred offering for the priest. Uh, again, as you're reading, it's like one of those, you got to look at it, do a little research. Why the breast and the right thigh? What is the symbolism? What is the meaning of those pieces? And... Uh, I would imagine there's um, an unpacking of the meaning of those, but we're going to just keep reading. It is a permanent right of Aaron and his descendants to share in the peace offerings brought by the people of Israel. This is their rightful share. The special gifts presented to the Lord have been reserved for Aaron and his descendants from the time they were set apart to serve the Lord as priests. On the day they were anointed, the Lord commanded the Israelites to give these portions to the priest as their permanent share from generation to generation. These are the instructions for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, as well as the ordination offering and the peace offering. The, <laughs> the Lord gave these instructions to Moses on Mount Sinai when he commanded the Israelites to present their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. So we're going to keep reading. So those are all these instructions about how to do all the different types of offerings that were were required in the law. Now we're on to chapter 8 of Levitic Leviticus. We're going to get all the way through that and a few verses of 9. Ah yes, the ordination of the priest. Then the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron and his sons along with their sacred garments, the anointing oil, the bull for the sin offering, the two rams, and the basket of bread made without yeast, and call the entire community of Israel together at the entrance of the tabernacle. So Moses followed the Lord's instructions, and the whole community assembled at the tabernacle entrance. Moses announced to them, This is what the Lord has commanded us to do. Then he presented Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He put the official tunic on Aaron and tied the sash around his waist. He dressed him in the robe, placed the ephod on him, and attached the ephod securely with its decorative sash. Then Moses placed the chest piece on Aaron and put the Urim and Thurman, or Thuman, Urim and Thuman inside it. Uh, he placed the turban on Aaron's head and attached the gold medallion the badge of holiness, to the front of the turban, just as the Lord had commanded him. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, making them holy. He sprinkled the oil on the altar seven times, anointing it and all its utensils, as well as the wash basin and its stand, making them holy. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head, anointing him and making him holy for his work. Next, Moses presented Aaron and his sons, Aaron's sons, I mean. He clothed them in their tunics, tied their sashes around them, and put their special head coverings on them, just as the Lord had commanded him. Then Moses presented the bull for the sin offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the bull's head, and Moses slaughtered it. Moses took some of the blood with his finger, and he put it on the four horns of the altar to purify it. He poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Through this process, he made the altar holy by purifying it. Then Moses took all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat around them, and he burned it all on the altar. He took the rest of the bull, including its hide, meat, 
and dung and burned it on a fire outside the camp, just as the Lord had commanded him. So again, as we're reading this and all these instructions and these rituals, the key words, remember, as the Lord had commanded. And this time, well, and in any time, it's about obedience to the Lord. What is the Lord doing in this time? What is the Lord calling for in this time? And there you go, as the Lord commanded. Then Moses presented the ram for the burnt offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the ram's head, and Moses slaughtered it. Then Moses took the ram's blood and splattered it against all sides of the altar. Then he cut the ram into pieces, and he burned the head, some of its pieces and the fat on the altar. After washing the internal organs and the legs with water, Moses burned the entire ram on the altar as a burnt offering. It was a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded him. Now, I see that phrase, a pleasing aroma, and I'm thinking, well, was it pleasing to the Lord, or was this sac these sacrificial things, because of the mixture of things and the way it was done, I mean, I'm not being cheeky here or funny, but like barbecue, you know, the sense of burning meat or cooking meat, now they were burning everything, so... Something that tells me it wasn't quite the way we think of having meat cooked. There was actual a burning, but somehow this aroma, that's always curious to me. That aroma is pleasing to the Lord. Hmm. Very curious. 22. Then Moses presented the other ram, which was the ram of ordination. <laughs> Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the ram's head, and Moses slaughtered it. Then Moses took some of its blood and applied it to the lobe of Aaron's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, and the big toe of his right foot. Many times, side note here, another commentary, the right hand of God, the right side of something, the right of things, uh, from my understanding in a lot of you know, biblical literature, it's the place of authority and the power of God. So the right side is God's, like Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. So anyway, just a thought, all of this right side Next, Moses presented Aaron's sons and applied some of the blood to the lobes of their right ears, the thumbs of their right hands, the big toes of their right feet. He then splattered the rest of the blood against all sides of the altar. Next, Moses took the fat, including the fat of the broad tail, the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat around them, along with the right thigh. On top of these, he placed a thin cake of bread made without yeast, a cake of bread mixed with olive oil, and a wafer spread with olive oil. And all these were taken from the basket of bread made without yeast. That was placed in the Lord's presence. He put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons, and he lifted them up as a special offering to the Lord. Moses then took all the offerings back from them and burned them on the altar on top of the burnt offering. This was the ordination offering. It was a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. Then Moses took the breast and lifted it up as a special offering to the Lord. This was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination, just as the Lord had commanded him. Next, Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood that was on the altar, and he sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and their garments. In this way, he made Aaron and his sons and their garments holy. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the remaining meat of the offerings at the tabernacle entrance and eat it there, along with the bread that is the basket of offerings for the ordination. Just as I commanded when I said, Aaron and his sons will eat it. Any meat or bread that is left over must then be burned up. So no leftovers. What was left was given totally to the Lord. You must not leave the tabernacle entrance for seven days, for this is when the ordination ceremony will be completed. Imagine that, seven days staying at the tabernacle where they served at the entrance. Everything we have done today was commanded by the Lord in order to purify you, making you right with Him. Now stay at the entrance of the tabernacle day and night for seven days and do everything the Lord requires. If you fail to do this, you will die. <laughs> wow. If you fail to do these requirements, they would die. That's a strong motivation, right? For this is what the Lord has commanded. 
Amazing. So Aaron and his sons did everything the Lord had commanded through Moses. And chapter 9, we're going to read up to verse 6. After the ordination ceremony on the eighth day, Moses called together Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, take a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defects, and present them to the Lord. Then tell the Israelites, take a male goat for a sin offering and take a calf and a lamb, both a year old and without defects, for a burnt offering. Also take a bull and a ram for a peace offering. Wow. And flour moistened with olive oil for, for a grain offering. Present all these offerings so offerings to the Lord because the, the Lord will appear to you today. Wow, what a day that must have been. So a special day. The Lord appears, right? Verse 5, So the people presented all these things at the entrance of the tabernacle, just as Moses had commanded. Then the whole community came forward and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do, so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. That is the key thing. All of this is about the that the glory of God could appear to the people. Man, we're going to read on tomorrow, but they're, they're telling us to hold right there. That gives us some anticipation. So they've done all this work, and the glory of the, the Lord is going to appear to the Israelites. Let's move on. Today's reading of Psalms is Psalm 37. And yeah, we're picking it up here at 12, verse 12. And we're going to read through the... 29th verse. Psalm 37 is long. It's going to go until tomorrow also. All right. Psalm 37 verse 12. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs. For he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right but their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. It is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and to be rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times, even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers, and so it should be through all of time. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. Again, we have to remember, I'm going to stop here just for a minute. When we read Old Testament or even in the Psalms, when a psalmist is pouring out their heart, the times change. And even in that time, sometimes they see, you know, you read this and you think, well, God's just going to make everything beautiful and it's going to be all roses. Life didn't always work out that way. And yet, in the eternal sense, it does. So we have to remember, sometimes we're seeing things in a snapshot. And, it's like, and then we go like, Lord, I didn't see it work out like that, or even nowadays. And especially now, in in this era, good and bad are happening alike. You know, in the earth, the you'll see in the New Testament where it says, darkness will increase, but also the glory of God will increase. So there again, what's that? That's the story of what? The weed and the tares, or the weed, wheat and the weeds, right? Good and bad. It's all navigating together in the earth. So we don't always see this thing where the you know, the righteous are prospering or the wicked are conquered. Not in the immediate times. And so just saying that so your hearts are never... God doesn't want us to get frustrated with the things of the world and the way the earth navigates. Okay, moving on, and we're going to continue. So, that those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. We're still in Psalm 37 up at verse 23 all the way through 29. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. Well, he always does that. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young, and now I am old. 
Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. There is a calling as believers to be as helpful as we can be, to be generous. Uh, there's other Proverbs that says that, that the generous person always has more. The stingy person never seems to have enough. There's, some, there's a spiritual dynamic to being righteous and good and generous and kind and merciful and all those attributes that represent really who the Lord is. Moving on, verse 27, Turn from evil and do good, and you will live in the land, for the Lord loves justice, and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. And that's where they want us to stop for today for Psalm 37 at verse 29. So I'll follow that lead. The reading of Proverbs for today is as follows. Proverbs 10, just verse 5. How about that? Proverbs 10, verse 5. A wise youth harvest in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. Hmm. I'll stop there. Yeah, they said one proverb for the day. It's interesting why they would only do one. Well, the emphasis of that is so strong. A wise youth harvest. In other words, people, even the young, we work when the time is right. And, um, and if we miss that time, sometimes it's missed. Although in Old Testament that may have brought about, um, there are fruits to actions. On the other hand, in the age of grace, God gives mercy and there's, you know, there's new mercy every day. You know, we, if we mess up, God lets us now try again. <laughs> and that's the wonderful thing of thank God for mercy and his grace. But anyway, I'll move on. That's all they had. Proverbs 10, verse 6. One of those like chew on that for the day. Let that stir in your heart. And the New Testament today February 19th is Mark 3.31, and we are going to go all the way through 4.25. So let's pick it up here. And wow, hmm. remember yesterday, kind of, it was, that was a heavy statement Jesus made uh, right above this, Mark 3, verse 23, where Jesus said, you know, they're accusing Jesus, he's, he's of a demon. Even his family thinks he's wacky, right? Uh, if you remember that story, they're like, his family says he's out of his mind. Imagine that, Jesus' own family, whatever that was, brothers and sisters, or it might have been relatives from that knew Jesus, they think he's off his rocker. <laughs> That's sad. They don't recognize him as Messiah, but they see all this amazing stuff, and then the religious people say he's a demon. Hmm? Jesus is letting them have it there at verse 23. So that's a good place to chew on, and it's such a strong reminder. And he's being clear, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. He says, I'm not of Satan. No. it would. Uh, and then he says at verse 28, this is huge, huge. I like, put like five-star statement. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. You can't get away from this statement. It's so weighty and sobering and uh, and he told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. So when Jesus is confronted that hard, he's proclaiming the truth, the truth of it. He's even allowing for people. Remember I said yesterday that idea of what all sins can be forgiven and blasphemies and things like that. But blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is basically the spirit of truth. It's rejecting truth. It's rejecting God. Jesus, and even Jesus said, if you reject me, you reject the Father. And um, I would just lay out for, for this, to chew on this, when people wonder, well, Carl, you know, Jesus, this guy, that guy, other prophets, who, what's the big deal? I believe in God. That's all I need. That's it. Yeah, I believe there's a God. Uh, I ask you to weigh that. It just, you have to really ask the Lord and weigh that. What that is, is that is a spirit, and without judgment, that's a spirit of arrogance. That's resisting. Like, I have my way of believing in God. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my... No. No. 
truth is truth. There can't be multiple truths. And that's not with, with bitterness or angst or judgment. I'll let God navigate that. But if this is true, if this is truth and the gospel or the good news of the kingdom that, of who Jesus is, that is the ultimate truth. Jesus said it throughout. As you read the New Testament, I challenge anyone uh, to, you know, in humility and humbleness, humble yourself. Don't be arrogant or full of pride and say, I'm going to discover what truth is. Who is this Jesus? And I just bless you and encourage you to humble yourself and receive what the Lord even said about himself. He's the one that says, God, yes, has grace and kindness and forgiveness. There is one God. There is one God. And he made one way for salvation. And he's the one that said it. I mean, if it would have read like, yes, I have many ways to be, to know me and come to me through any channel. You know, there's many doors come to me by any door. The New Testament doesn't bear that out, folks. And I've had people say that, well, you know, this is your truth. And I'm like, I get that, you know, phil philosophical studies. I've read a lot of stuff. I went to school and studied world religions and philosophy. It doesn't make us haters or judgers because we're upholding Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Because this is what he said. He wants people to know God, to have a way to him. And it's actually profoundly simple, and yet it's a paradox that it's it demands a decision. So anyway, a Felt like that's for somebody today. Somebody has to weigh this today. And again, uh, you have to stay in a place of peace and yet the, the gravity of what this is. Jesus is the one that says this sin has eternal consequences. Uh, uh, we can't get away from that. Or we just say, I don't believe this. No, this is wrong. Just a story. Okay. I pray that you change your mind about it. That's what repent, repentance is. I change the way I think. I get it. And that was my experience receiving the Lord. Not just a faith of experience or tradition, which are okay. Traditions are great. But if it doesn't become personal, if it's not a heart thing, mm -mm, no, it doesn't work like that. So, okay. So that was the end of yesterday's reading. <laughs> Thank you all for tracking with me. And if you're still seeking, I invite you to just... Humble yourself and ask the Lord to reveal himself and to, or to acknowledge it. Take the leap of faith. Step into the Lord. Receive him and know him today. Okay? So today's reading is actually Mark. <laughs> Mark 3, starting at 31. So he's gone through this intense confrontation. Verse 31 starts, Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, and they stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. How about that? You notice he doesn't say father. Pretty amazing, right? There's only one God. He's the one Father. Anyone who does God's will, the Father's will, is my brother and sister and mother. That is powerful. Yes, Lord. Chapter 4. Here we go. Chapter 4, all the way up to 25. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed, and as he scattered it across this field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted and grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. 
Later, when Jesus was alone with the twelve disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, You are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And here's what it said. And this was from Isaiah, actually, chapter 6. When, when they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. So is he saying he would withhold it from them? Or is he just recognizing the condition of people's hearts? I think that's exactly what he's saying. He knows the condition of people. So Jesus, in that time, he was revealing certain things to the disciples because they were going to carry on the gospel. And you have to realize, too, Jesus had not died and risen yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't come. So in that time, when that all explodes on the scene and the church is exploding and growing fast and taking root, a lot of this stuff becomes fulfilled and it moves on. But their time stories still speak to people of unbelief and it offers them a way to think through and get a breakthrough to understand, to come to faith. So that's kind of where he's at with that. Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. That's the seed, God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed, in other words, people hear the story of the gospel. It's like, nah, I'm out of here. That's silly. That's Satan stealing their salvation or their ability to receive it. It's still a choice, but there's always deception. There's always the good news going out, and there's always the liar. And that's Satan's M.O. He lies, steals, destroys, kills. He wants to stop anything that has to do with the kingdom. So people, again, the ability the free will to hear it and receive it and believe or reject it. God doesn't control us like puppets. Okay, everybody, I made you, and so now you're all mine. That would not be the way of love, and God is love and light and perfection. He wouldn't have needed, needed if it was all about manipulation and control, it would not have needed to work like that. And people say, well, why God didn't do that? And I always say, would you like to be controlled? Would you just feel like, like to be a robot and like, Oh, you know, I want to control these people or I want to be controlled and somebody loves me. It's like, we know that doesn't work like that. Human beings, we understand it. If we're honest, we get this. Okay, I'm going to move on. Verse 16, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as they had planted. Thank you, Lord. Verse 21, Then Jesus asked them, would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open, and every secret will be brought to the light. Anyone who hears, well, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Wow, what a profound... Again, Jesus is calling to everyone to say, have ears to hear. Humble yourself and be willing to hear. Like clean the slate. Whatever you feel like is a hindrance. I just bless people and all of you hearing this with the ability to hear the spirit of truth in this. Not Carl. It's the spirit of truth from the Lord speaking it. Verse 24, Then he added, Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. How about that? The closer you listen... I love that. The more you understanding, you'll be given, and you will receive even more. Wow. Gosh, so much popping into my head. The wise grow wiser still. As we cry out for more of the Lord, there's more that comes. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. 
but for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Folks, man, that is so powerful and true. And we're going to stop there. That's the end of today's reading. Um, yeah, Mark 2 and all the way through, oh, I'm sorry, Mark 4 through 25. I went a little farther. No, that's exactly right. All right, we'll pick up tomorrow with the daily Bible reading. Bless you all. Uh, ponder in your heart, wherever you are in the journey. If if you're deep in, I just bless you with growing more in the knowledge of the Lord. If you're seeking Him, open your heart today and just receive Him and dive in and just receive the goodness of God and the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. I bless you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.